Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, thanks for coming to the um, Discover Your Future Through Science uh, Rehabilitation Science uh, event tonight. Um, how many of you have attended other Discover Your Future? Anyone? Nope. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how about um, are all of you science students or other faculties? Science? Okay. So welcome, I'm Christine Adams. I'm an academic advisor in the Faculty of Science. Um, and so I'm here representing science. We coordinate this event for students um, and then invite uh, other faculties to present to us or to our students about getting into their programs. So I'm leaving most of the presentation up to uh, these people here in the front row that I'll introduce to you in a moment. Um, and they'll talk about their programs, their admission requirements, those sorts of things. What you need to know is that um, what they're going to require of you to gain admission can easily fit into a science degree as either a required course or an elective and that advisors in the Dean's Office in Science can help you figure out how to build the courses that are required by um, OT, PT and uh, respiratory therapy into a science degree. So we can help you with that and we're just located in 239 McRae Hall if you've uh, never been there before. So you could certainly come and see us and we can help you with that. Uh, so I'm going to start now by introducing the people that we have here today. Um, so first we have Francis Diaz. Uh, he's presenting for the Master of Occupational Therapy program. Uh, Francis actually graduated from the Faculty of Science uh, last fall, October 2016, with a general science degree, um, with his courses having a particular focus towards biochemistry. Uh, as an OT student, he has been to two Northern Manitoba reserves over the summer of 2017, and will be collaborating with an Indigenous community reserve during the school year as part of research-focused coursework. Uh, Francis is currently involved in employment directly related to OT as a research assistant for an OT professor and as a project assistant for the Rehab Department of Health Sciences, Health Sciences Centre. Thanks for coming, Francis. And then we have Lindsay Brook, and she's presenting for the Master of Physical Therapy program. Lindsay is a second year student in the Master of Physical Therapy program. Lindsay grew up in rural Manitoba before moving to Toronto to complete an undergraduate degree at York University. While attending York University, Lindsay was privileged to play with the varsity hockey team. In addition to school, Lindsay currently leads a gym program at Shlom Misham, volunteers as a student physiotherapist for the St. Patel Mustangs, and is involved in admissions events and the Master of Physical Therapy MMI, which Kristen will probably talk to you about. <laughs> Um, our third speaker then is Denise Mackey and she's presenting for the Bachelor of Respiratory Therapy program. Denise graduated from the Respiratory Therapy program at the College of North Atlantic in St. John's, Newfoundland in 2000. Since then she has completed a postgraduate certification in sleep medicine and has gained experience in critical care, pulmonary diagnostics and education. Denise is currently a faculty member at the University of Manitoba in the respiratory therapy program and has an ongoing interest in sleep medicine and mechanical ventilation in addition to teaching and learning. And then the fourth speaker will be Kristen Stephenson and she's the admissions and recruitment officer for the College of Rehabilitation Sciences and she's presenting program admissions information. Kristen graduated from the University of Manitoba with a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Bachelor of Education degree. Kristen currently works for the College of Rehabilitation Sciences, planning recruitment events, advising potential applicants, and assessing program applications. Thank you all for coming. And then I'll be here afterwards for questions if you have questions more related to science degrees. Um, and I assume you guys will all stay for questions as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Oh, and just so you know that this is being recorded, so um, if you do have questions, it will be going on the um, camera. Whew. Okay. Okay, so I will start. I am a second year OT student, and that's my email. We have the college open house on January 21st next year. 
Um, so if anyone wants to know more about the programs we offer, please come to the open house. Um, my talk will include what is OT, um, where, do we, where do OTs work, and what is my OT story so far. So what is OT? Um, so I feel like, does anyone here know what OT is? Yes, no, that's okay. Um, it's okay because apparently no one knows what we do <laughs> and one does not simply explain what OT is. Um, so OT in its formal definition is called the art and science of enabling engagement in everyday living through occupation. And the big word here is occupation. When we think of occupation, we think of work, employment, but then for us, occupation is everything that you do from the moment you wake up to the next day when you wake up again. So that involves everything from eating, showering, going to work, going to school, um, and yeah, everything that you do in your day. So what does that mean? So let's say we have our client here who is a double amputee. So the question is, how does this person shower? How does this person, how could this person play sports, go to work or school, sleep, drive home, and grocery shop? These are things that we probably do not think of in our everyday lives, but then for this person, he would have to plan ahead and work with an OT to come up with strategies and um, adaptations to his home or work environment to enable him to participate fully. So another, pr another one is with someone with depression, how do you grocery shop, take care of yourself, make friends, go to work or school, or, and take care of your family. Um, and someone with a traumatic brain injury, so let's say from a car accident or a stroke, how do you feed yourself independently, do the laundry, remember how to get home from work or school, focus in school or at work, remember how to write your name, and remember to take your meds. So these are all things that um, an OT and a client will work together to come up with strategies and ways to um, do, do those things as independently as you can. And, uh, and especially if it's a meaningful occupation for that person. So where do OTs work in? We work in a variety of areas like this play place. Um, so pediatric OTs could work here. Um, we work in schools, working with kids. Um, we work in hospitals, outpatients, inpatients, working with um, the age range from neonate, neonates to um, older adults. We work at home. We do home assessments. We do home visits for our clients. But we also do work assessments, so ergonomics and all that. So basically, where do OTs work in? It's everywhere you can find a person, an OT could be working in there. So everywhere, everywhere from hospitals, schools, mental health facilities, home care, PCHs, private clinics, rehab centers, insurance companies, client homes, and client workplaces. So my OT journey so far is that I had two clinical placements. My first one was at Children's Hospital. I was dealing with young kids who forgot how to feed after being intubated for a long time. So, they're, so we're looking at strategies on how to get them to feed again, be it like a proper strategy, a proper technique, or a proper nipple and bottle um, combination for that kid. So I did that. And then I was also at the pediatric special care unit where we have kids who have been hospitalized their entire lives. So think of a two-year-old in hospital his or her entire life. So that kid will most likely be delayed in some developmental aspects. So we do, um, we do developmental play for those kids to get them back into their developmental milestones. And then my second placement was at, a care, at care homes in Winnipeg where I was with older adults looking at um, safety, so preventing them from falls. Um, dealing with um, ambulation or walking issues. So we did wheelchair assessments, we did walking programs, and 
yeah, just trying to get them as independent as they want in the personal care home. Okay, so becoming an OT, um, I feel like we will talk about it at one point later, but then it's a two-year master's program, so you need a bachelor's and some prerequisite courses. That's just what I said. So um, the, the way the program is laid out is that you go into academic um, coursework, then you go into field work, and then academic coursework, then field work. So it's alternating between academics and field work, which is great because um, it gives you a break from all the academics, but then it also allows you to integrate all your learning that way. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. So yeah, again, open house next year, January 21st. Thank you. How does this work? Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, guys, so my name is Lindsay and I'm a second year physiotherapy student. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in kin, although I did spend three years in bio before I got to that point. Um, so I'm gonna explain just a little bit of what, about what physio is and hopefully when you leave you have a better idea. So physiotherapy is an effective treatment for injury and illness. That's pretty broad. But we like to utilize a lot of manual treatments, um, so working with our hands to um, help people with their pain, help them move, move better, um, and just help them hopefully be able to do a lot of things that they love to do in their daily life. So we like to use science, which you guys all know about. We like to use evidence-based care, so you'll learn about things called clinical practice guidelines, which people kind of merge all of the best evidence that there is out there into one guideline so that if there is um, a pathology that you're working with, you can bring up these clinical practice guidelines and it gives you a great idea of where the best evidence is. The coolest part about physio is that along with these two things, you get to be a little bit creative and use um, some of your clinical expertise. So as you work longer in the field, you kind of figure out what works for specific people and what works for specific conditions and then you can kind of put your own creative touch using evidence and science at the same time. Um, so do you guys have an idea of where physios might work? There's kind of two broad areas. Has anyone been to a physio before? Yeah? Where did you go? Do you mind where you're saying where you went? Um, I just went to like a clinic. Um, like a practice? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's one, private practice. Um, and then the other one would be a public sector. So within the public sector would be hospitals, home care programs, um, and then within the hospitals, inpatient and outpatient. So if you had a surgery and you were in the hospital, um, there'd be physios there before you were discharged that would work with you. But then if you need more physio afterwards, there's also outpatient services offered throughout the hospital. And then private practice would be the other one. Um, so what do we exactly do? So when a patient comes into the clinic, we're going to assess them for whatever their primary complaint is. Um, we're going to offer them treatment and then we are going to give them techniques that they can manage on their own. So that's the biggest part about physio, is that we give you, um, after whether it be four, 10 uh, treatment sessions, we're gonna give you something that you can do at home so that you can be independent in um, what we've given you. That way we don't have to see you all the time and you're able to get back to your life and manage it independently. Um, that's what I said there. So, there's kind of four basic areas that we work in. Does anybody have an idea? Can I pick on you again? Mm -hmm. Yes. So what would, did you go in for the first for your when you took it? Like musculoskeletal, so uh, ankle injuries. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then I went for the neuromusculoskeletal. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Do you have more? I don't know. No, that was great. That's so that's two of the. Two of the main three. So like you said, neuromuscular, so that's kind of your, um, your ankle sprains, your frozen shoulder, your rotator cuff injuries. Um, a lot of private practices deal with mainly with those kinds of um, issues. The second one would be cardiovascular. So if you have had a heart attack, um, you're in the, patient, in the hospital post-op, um, there's gonna be physiotherapists that work in that area. 
Third one, like you said, would be neuro. So patients, um, stroke patients, um, spinal cord patients, or if there's developmental delays in any pediatric patients, that would be a neuro area. And the fourth, so I've kind of skipped through those. The fourth would be, it's kind of up and coming, but it's a women's health. Um, this is really exciting for me, um, a passion of mine. And um, in regards to business, it's really growing. So great from a business perspective, also a great option. Um, with women's health, we're doing things looking at pelvic floor, um, uh, women who have had breast cancer and are seeking treatment afterwards. Um, a lot of women to this point have just felt like they needed to deal with those problems on their own and there's so much that physio can do um, to help you. So that's a new like up and coming area. That's really exciting. So, <laughs> pardon me. Um, it's a two year program, similar to OT. So you need an undergraduate degree with certain prerequisite courses and um, it's a combination of academic and clinical, just like OT. So in your first year, all you do is um, neuro, neuromuscular skeletal. So you do a whole year of it, and then you're gonna do 12 weeks of placement at the end. Your second year, you're gonna start with cardio resp. So that's your um, respiratory conditions or um, your cardiovascular conditions, so heart attacks. Um, and you're gonna do a six week placement there. And then last but not least, um, we go into neuro, and you would do another um, six weeks of neural placement, and then you get one elective at the end. So whatever you're most interested in, then you get to choose one for that. So I did my first two placements. My first one was a outpatient private practice in Morden, and I had a wonderful experience there. And the one I'm doing right now is um, with the St. Vital Mustangs team, which is really exciting. So um, it's a football club. It ranges from kids eight to 22. So you get these little guys who have like a bruised thumb and they need a Band-Aid, um, all the way up to 22-year-olds um, who have kind of a more um, elaborate pathology and more elaborate um, injuries going on. The, that placement, um, it's uh, chosen, so you kind of have to interview, a little bit of interview process, and you get to go with four other people in your class. So it's a student-run clinic, um, we're in there, we get to bounce ideas off of each other, and it's just a really cool opportunity. Um, yeah, anybody have any questions? Everybody, <laughs> one second. Okay, does that sound okay? <laughs> Sorry, I should have re rethought the scarf now with this microphone. <laughs> okay, all right. So my name is Denise Mackey. I actually um, had a student scheduled to be here tonight, but she got ill. <laughs> So that's why I'm here. I know sometimes you guys like to hear from students, which is really, really helpful, that are currently in the program. So anyway, I hopefully I can fill her shoes <laughs> and give you like the experience of the respiratory therapy program, uh, pulmonary function, lots of different areas, which brought me to Manitoba to do education. So just a little bit about kind of where I've been and some of my experiences. Respiratory therapy is basically a health profession devoted to respiratory and associated disorders. So we're looking at treatment, management, um, education, a lot of things that are incorporated within that. Has anyone here heard of a respiratory therapist? Well, that's good. I feel like I really relate to OT because <laughs> everyone has heard of a physical therapist or a physiotherapist. I mean, they have a pretty high profile, but I think respiratory therapy and occupational therapy are a little bit not as well known, but I think it's improving. People are becoming more aware, so that's really great. So what does a respiratory therapist do? Um, so a lot of the things that we do, I often relate to, you know, Grey's Anatomy or, <laughs> or do you remember that old show ER? You know, some of those old medical shows. Sometimes I like to kind of think of it in that way. This is a picture here. I know it looks a little bit scary at first when you look at it. It's a premature baby. <coughs> Excuse me. But one of the important things that we do is we secure an airway. So I don't know if you remember watching some of those shows. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, and we actually put an airway into their lungs so we can hook them up to life support. So that's one of our important roles. I know that it seems a little bit scary when you look at the picture, but we actually start out on mannequins. We, we have a simulation facility that we use, 
And then you spend, I think it's four to six weeks in the operating room practicing on real patients, doing that all day long. So by the time you're finished with all of those placements and simulations, you're well prepared to do those type of skills. So I know it does, does look a little bit, <laughs> a little bit scary in the picture, I realize, but um, our, our program does prepare you for that. So that's a really important part of our job, securing airways so that we can provide ventilation or some people call it life support. So that is another important part of our job. Um, adult mechanical ventilation or ventilator management, we also use this therapy on neonates. Similar to OT and PT, we work across the lifespan. So from neonates that are born prematurely to people at the end of their life. So we, I think that we all share that similarity. When I talk about mechanical ventilation, this is basically when somebody can't breathe on their own. So um, as we sit here right now and we're breathing, we're not even thinking about how we're breathing. So how often do you breathe? How deep do you breathe? When you breathe, do you breathe in really fast or do you breathe in really slow? Like how much oxygen are we breathing? So there's a lot of things that are involved and when we apply this therapy to even somebody with normal lungs, it can be challenging. So when we think about people with um, respiratory pathophysiology, it's really, really difficult. So I think we have currently six, about 12 credit hours in our program that is dedicated to teaching our students about how to mechanically ventilate a patient. So we are the sole professional that is involved with this. We initiate it, we maintain it, we wean from it, we troubleshoot it. Um, so we do a lot with mechanical ventilation. It's basically breathing for somebody. So it's a really important job. And so that's why we, we dedicate so much time to it. And um, again, we use a lot of labs. We have a lot of these, this expensive equipment at our facility, actually, a number of different models, different ones you can practice on. We do simulation. So everything is about making it like a real life situation before you get in the situation. <laughs> so we can prepare you for that real situation. Um, we have, our program is, um, a three-year program and the final year is all clinical placement. So that really kind of, we try to expose you to different areas so you'll be prepared um, to work as a respiratory therapist. We're part of the code blue and trauma team. So what that means is we, if you're working in acute care, which is a hospital, you usually carry a pager and at any moment, if someone does have a cardiac arrest or somebody comes in with a, a trauma patient, that we are part of the team that's called right away. So the interesting thing about this, and, and a lot of our job opportunities are in hospitals, is you know we could be doing patient education one moment, and then we could get um, a trauma coming through emerge, a gunshot wound or whatnot, and we could be putting an airway in and setting them up on life support. So it's a really dynamic and changing profession. It's the type of thing you go in and work your shift and you have no idea what the day holds. <laughs> so just to give you an idea, some people really like that and some people don't, you know what I mean? Everybody's different, everyone wants something different. But it's very, it is, um, you really have no idea what to expect when you work, um, you know, as a respiratory therapist, unless you're working in certain different types of areas, but typically um, it can kind of be that changing and dynamic. So we do take blood. I don't know how you guys feel about blood. Some people aren't sure. <laughs> Some people think they would be okay with it. Um, we take blood from the arteries, so it's a little bit of a different type of blood sampling. So when you go for a physical and you get blood taken that's not that type of blood, that's venous blood, we normally take it from an artery, which is what all of your tissues are getting. So in terms of gases, oxygenation, and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, sometimes people may think they have a fear of blood, but sometimes when you get into the program, you actually adapt to it and are fine. And I mean, I've, I've trained with people, I've worked with people who had a fear of blood products and blood, and they have went on and become RTs working in trauma rooms and stuff, so. <laughs> you never know. I'm looking at some of your faces. <laughs> some of you are okay. Then I see some, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> so anyway, that's okay. I, I mean, it's, um, Every, every profession has its has different components. We also analyze the blood. So um, this is kind of a part that's going over to the lab portion, lab tech, technology or lab technicians, but we still are involved in the analysis of the blood. 
Um, I, we are involved in a lot of emergency room management. So some of the things that I already talked about could be putting an airway in someone's lungs, setting them up on a ventilator, even just treating someone who had an asthma attack, who's coming into the emergency department. Um, any of those things, even patient education or therapy education, some, um, it could be anything really that's coming into emergency departments in an acute care center. So we do actually a lot of transport, transportation. So transporting patient from one area to the next. Um, I think I have a few on this. So air transport, ground transport. Um, this may not seem like an important role, but if you think of someone who's really critically ill, which is who we deal with mostly, um, even the role of them breathing, they can't take on that role. They can't expend that energy. So actually transporting them from one place to another is actually can be really risky. So there's a lot involved with that. So we are directly involved with that process. In some centers, we actually lead that process. So it depends kind of where you are, but it's a very, very important important role, important job to transport these very, very ill patients. We're also involved with other therapies, um, non-invasive ventilation. Has anyone ever heard the term CPAP, sleep apnea? It's becoming pretty prevalent um, as compared to 10 or 20 years ago. So uh, we are involved with all of those therapies. It's called non-invasive ventilation. And um, we use it for multiple mul different types of patients. Actually, I could li list off a ton. <laughs> it's a very popular therapy. Um, here it's for a newborn baby who's not quite strong enough to breathe on their own, so they need some assistance. So they just need a little bit of positive pressure ventilation, and it's supplied through a mask. Very, very um, high demand therapy. It's used quite often. This one here is a very, very old picture. <laughs> I don't know, I do like it, so I keep using it. <laughs> um, we don't actually use the wraps anymore. We have really good straps. and. Uh, we don't actually need them, <laughs> but we used to use the head wraps. And this is in adults receiving non-invasive ventilation. Uh, we also do a lot of diagnosis. So you come in to see your patient. They're not doing so well. Why? What happened? What happened to them overnight? Let's do some testing. Let's do some diagnostic numbers. And let's work as part of the healthcare team to try to find out what happened and how we can um, help this patient. We also do diagnostic tests such as pulmonary function lab here, which is um, also known as spirometry. It's basically just diagnosing or telling us what your lung function is. So that's all that that is. Um, but very important in, in diagnosis of respiratory disease. So uh, we're actively involved with that as well. Um, another area which is very new and exciting for us, um, we're really branching out into, is long-term care and community care. Um, for some patients with, say, for example, a neuromuscular dis like dysfunction, for example, ALS, I know a lot of people know what that is now, ever since we had that social media with the ice bucket challenge, do you guys remember that? <laughs> you know, that was I think a couple of years ago. So diseases like that that are really progressive, that the patient loses muscular function, they may have to go home on a breathing machine. So that's a really big job for us because we have to educate the family, educate the patient, monitor them, assess them. So it's a really, really important job for us as well and, and a kind of a, a newer area that's becoming uh, that we're becoming more and more involved in. Other areas, um, health <coughs> promotion, so helping, helping people, we, how do we prevent lung disease? We want to prevent it before it starts, so that's really important. Um, research, education, working in the operating room with the anesthetist is, is another role that we can take on. Disaster relief teams, um, this is a newer area for us as well. So in recent years, I would say in probably the last 10 years, we've started going overseas for desk disaster relief teams. Like RTs went to the earthquake in Haiti, so that was about seven years ago or so. Um, and we have a program called RT Without Borders, and they're working out of mainly Nepal right now, just working with the healthcare providers to help improve therapies and, and things like that. And they fundraise, and um, they actually go back and forth. So we do have some of that global health initiative that's happening, so that's really great. That's a newer thing for us as well. Where do we work? Private healthcare clinics, community care. I think I mentioned a lot of these. There's a lot of different areas that a respiratory therapist can work in. Acute care being the most common. And we work with all, like I said before, premature infants to people at the end of life. Those with the di newly diagnosed with a disease or chronic condition. 
Um, I won't say too much. I don't think I have much about this, but just we're a three-year program and we are undergraduate as compared to OT and PT. Um, I think I'll leave it there and, and let Kristen take over <laughs> to, do, to do the admissions. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for coming out this evening. Um, you've probably heard the most exciting part of the presentation already. I'm going to be covering the admissions requirements. Um, but if you're interested in applying to one of our programs, um, it'll include some important dates that'll be coming up over the next academic year and a little bit of an overview of our requirements for all three programs. Okay. So first we'll look at occupational therapy. So right now, the, uh, um, the application's open for occupational therapy if you're considering applying for fall 2018. So there's a couple of different deadline dates. Um, if anyone's an international student, the deadline to apply is January 15th, 2018. And for Canadian um, US applicants, it's February 1st, 2018. And there is an interview process. So for this upcoming year, the interview date is scheduled to take place on Saturday, April 28th. So if you're considering applying, you may want to keep that date in mind. And uh, the requirements for OT include a three or four year undergraduate degree. And there are five prerequisite subject, um, subjects for this, uh, this program. And any of this information is available on our website. So it may seem a little bit overwhelming as I give it to you all at once. Um, but you can check the website and feel free to contact our office at any time for uh, if you have any questions or need clarification. So the minimum grade of a B is required in all prerequisite courses. And if you're looking to apply for next fall, you'll want to have the prerequisite courses completed by the end of this winter term. So for April 30th, 2018. The minimum GPA um, is a 3.0 or a B in the last 60 credit hours of study. But because we have more applicants than spots in the program, um, usually it's, it's a bit higher, and I'll get into that information in a second. Okay, so it's the last 60 credit hours of study that are used to rank applicants for the interview offers. The program typically offers up to 80, 84 interviews over that one day in April. And the interview for OT consists of three separate 20-minute interviews. So there's one interview with a faculty member, one with a student in the program, and one with a clinician. And the GPA of the last 60 credit hours and the interview results are combined, 50% each, um, for an overall ranking. And that's what the selections committee looks at when they determine offers for the program. So applicants are rank ordered in terms of that overall score. And for this program, usually the, um, the selections committee meet during the month of uh, May. So interviews take place the end of April, the committee meets a couple weeks after, and then we try and get the decisions out as quickly as possible so that people can plan for the next year. So often by the end of May, decisions are out to applicants. So up to 50 students are admitted to the OT program each fall. And for um, the last application cycle, we had 217 um, applicants. So it's hard to say what will happen this upcoming year. Last year, the minimum GPA in the last 60 credit hours to receive an interview invitation was 3.857 for Manitobans. And just with the nature of the applicant pool last year, we didn't, um, there weren't any offers to international applicants because the Manitoba pool was so competitive that the majority of, um, of interview spots get offered to Manitobans. So it was 3.857 for Manitobans, and then it was a little bit higher for other Canadians, and uh, no international applicants received interview offers. Okay, so now we'll just do a quick overview for physical therapy. And just to make it complicated, all three programs have different requirements and different interview processes and um, different percentages that they look at for GPA and interview results. So there'll be a few differences. So if you're considering applying to more than one program, just make sure you read through everything um, to ensure that you have all the required courses. 
So physical therapy applications are now open and their deadline's quite a bit earlier. So it's coming up November 15th, um, 2017 for next fall. So there's about a month left if you're interested in applying. Um, if you have any external courses other than U of M, um, transcripts are required by January 31st in order for marks to be considered. For U of M students, for all of our programs, we can get the marks internally through Aurora Student, so you don't need to worry about submitting transcripts or ordering them. And for PT, they have their multiple mini interview and their dates are already selected as March 3rd and 4th, um, 2018, so they're usually early in March, that's typically their schedule. Um, so the requirements for the program are Canadian citizenship or permanent residency at the time of application, a three or four year undergraduate degree in any area of study. They also require the successful completion of one 24 um, credit uh, academic year. So between September and April, you need to have um, one year at least in your academic record that has 24 credit hours or more. And a minimum GPA is needed in the last 60 credit hours of study. Um, the minimum is 3.25. So as long as you have 3.25 or higher, you'll have met that requirement. Um, and the minimum grade of a B in all prerequisite courses is needed. And that's usually the end of the fall term prior to the, the year you're trying to get into. So for anyone that's looking for fall 2018, all those prerequisite subjects need to be completed by December 31st of this year. So it does, that's where academic advisors can be really helpful in making sure that you get all those courses in when you're completing your undergraduate degree. So there are eight prerequisite subjects for PT, and I just have them listed here. On the website, you'll be able to find the exact course numbers that are approved, so you can make sure that, uh, that you, uh, you take the correct courses during the undergraduate uh, degree. And if you have any questions about prerequisites, you can always contact us. There are a few more courses than, are, uh, than what are posted on the website that are approved. Um, for example, the English Lit requirement. Um, we have the most common courses listed, but there are a few more courses available that you can complete if you, uh, if you decide to uh, look at three credit hour courses compared to a six credit hour course. Um, they do have time limits for their prerequisite um, sub subjects. So if you're looking to apply and you have really old courses, you'll want to contact our office to inquire about that. Sociology uh, has to be taken within five years of the application and all other prerequisite courses within 10 years of the application. Um, so it's actually, for physical therapy, it's the grade point average of prerequisite courses. So these sub subjects that are listed here on the uh, PowerPoint are the courses that they do a calculation on for the ranking for interviews. So it's different than, quite different than what other programs do. So PT offers up to 80 spots, um, interview spots, and they take place over two days. And their format is a little bit different. It's um, the multiple mini interview. So you may have heard of it. It's the same interview format that um, medicine uses. And there's a few other pro programs, phys physician's <coughs> assistant. Um, they use the MMI style as well. So it's uh, different stations that you move through. So there's eight different stations in the interview. And you'll have two minutes to read the question and then eight minutes to go into the room and answer the question, or it could be a collaboration question where you're directing someone. So it's, it's quite different than the other interview formats. Um, and for their program, they use that grade point average of prerequisite courses combined with the MMI score to get their overall score. So they do 60% grade point average of prerequisite courses, 40% MMI to get the overall. And that's what the selections committee looks at when they're determining offers for the program. So students are ranked based on that overall score for selections. And um, physical therapy usually have their selections meetings, their meeting mid-April, and then they get decisions out by the end of April for anyone that's looking to apply. So up to 50 students are admitted to the program each fall. Each fall. In 2017, there were 163 applications and there were up to 80 interviews offered over those two days. The minimum grade point average in prerequisite courses to make it to the interview stage for last year was 3.864 um, and that can fluctuate. We have, um, for, for our programs, um, for OT and PT, we have about the last five years of statistics available on the website. So you can take a look and just see where we're currently at with our programs. 
And as each um, fall starts, we try and update those statistics with what um, took place for the incoming class. Okay, and respiratory therapy is the third program. And this is a bachelor's program, as Denise mentioned. So the applications aren't open yet, but they will open on November 1st for fall 2018. The deadline for RT is April 1st, 2018, and the interview date has been scheduled for Saturday, June 9th. So the interviews take place all over one day um, as well for this program. So in order to apply, a minimum of 24 credit hours of university study is required by the end of the winter term, so by April in the year of application. Um, there's also some prerequisite courses that are required, and I have them listed there. They're on the website as well if you want the exact course numbers. And those have to be completed by April, um, just prior to the term you're trying to get into. So April 2018 for a fall 2018 application. And I suggest visiting the RT application bulletin if you're interested. The calculations that they have vary depending on your number of years of study. So it's a little bit complicated. So it's the bulletin's the best place to look for information on that. So for RT, the interview includes um, four 15-minute stations. So there's three interviews, one with a faculty, one with a student, and one with a clinician. And then there's also a 15-minute written um, station. And there's an overall score that's created for RT as well, and it's a different um, amount. It's one-third um, one interview, two-thirds adjusted grade point average. And then the applicants are ranked based on this overall score, just like the other selections committees uh, do. And um, because the interviews are June 9th, usually the selections um, committee meets middle of June, and decisions go out middle to end of June. And the RT program has up to 16 students admitted each fall. Um, last year we had 63 applications, and we were fortunate enough the last couple of years to offer interviews to everyone that was eligible. Um, so we were able to invite everyone that met the requirements to come for the, one, the, uh, the interview. Um, one thing I should note is they have um, different application categories for RT. They have um, category one and category two. And the last number of years, everyone that's been admitted has been a category one applicant. And that means that those students had 24 credit hours between September and April. So that's something that's been given priority is that if you can show that you can handle what's considered a full-time course load, um, successfully, then th those students are looked at first by, by the committee. Um, so the minimum adjusted grade point average for an applicant offered admission this last fall was 3.3. Okay, and then I just have a few general tips. You may already be familiar with some of this information um, from having applied to science. But there's a few things I'd just like to mention. It's important just to review the requirements prior to applying to make sure you have the required courses. Um, there's nothing worse than someone missing one course and thinking they had all the requirements and paying the money to apply. Um, be aware of important deadline dates. So the PT ones are coming up fairly soon, the application deadline, if you're interested. Um, visit the College of Rehabilitation Sciences Recruitment Events webpage. So we have a few presentations that'll be taking place. Usually our chairs of admission go out to career services. Um, we have a big open house, as Francis mentioned, taking place in January, and it's a really worthwhile event to come to. It's a student-led event, so it's a chance to meet students in the program, find out about what they're learning about, meet faculty and get admissions information. Um, one tip as well would be to check out uh, the Career Mentor Program. If you're not sure about exactly if you want to go into one of these professions, it's a good program through Career Services that's offered to U of M students, and it gives you a chance to connect with a professional where you can ask questions and ensure you're going into an area that you're really interested in. One other point I'd like to mention is um, Career Connect with Career Services offers, um, has offered workshops to help prep for interviews. So they've offered an MMI prep, um, usually uh, to students that are in the process of applying. And uh, last year they offered a prep workshop for um, OT applicants as well to help get ready for the interview. So it's worth checking things offered through Career, uh, Career Connect because it could be a helpful way to get you ready for the interview. Um, and then check your email and your junk folder to make sure you, you don't miss any things like if you did apply an interview invitation or an important email that we require something from you. So 
We have had people, I don't know why, but U of M even accounts where um, emails have ended up in the junk. So it's always good just to be checking. And with the selections process, um, so interview offers are extended prior to the interview dates. So usually we try and get them out at least three weeks before the interview dates. It can run a little tight depending on when the grades are coming in, especially for PT. Um, but approximately three weeks prior, interview invitations are extended. If an applicant doesn't receive the invitation, then their application isn't proceeding further in the process. Um, admissions decisions are sent to all applicants after the selections committees meet, so no matter what the decision is, you'll be getting some sort of um, letter posted to your self-service portal. And um, if you are offered admission, acceptance is required online. Um, sometimes people don't realize they have to take that step to click accept, and you do have to do that if you are offered a spot. And there is sometimes documentation required to finalize the application. Grad studies requires um, copy of a passport or a birth certificate. So just make sure you read any letters that you get because they may require something from you um, in order to finalize admission. And then OT and PT have update pages um, with, their, with posts by their chairs of admission. So they'll be posting when interview invites are going out and when decisions are made. So that's just a good way to, to keep informed. And if you have any questions, we have program email addresses um, for all three programs. Feel free to contact us at any of those uh, program email addresses, especially if you have specific questions related to your, your courses. And then finally, just the open house again that's taking place in January. It's um, Sunday, January 21st, and the time will be posted on our website. I think it's going to be 1 o'clock this year, but it hasn't been finalized yet. And um, it's, it's at Bannatyne campus where our college is located. So it's a great chance to come see our facility and, uh, and meet people uh, that are in the program and instructing with our programs. And if you have any questions, feel free. We can ask them now or you can come up individually if you have something specific that you want to ask. Thanks so much for coming out this evening.